So, we continue with Aaron Finon, aka Finux, uh, with how you should test and configure your IDS IPS and the uh, OSNIF framework. Okay, have fun. Feels like a, a case of deja vu, doesn't it? So, I'm going to talk about effective IDS IPS testing. There's the five things I really want you to walk away with from this today that testing an IDS IPS is critical. Why is it critical? Because it's part of your infrastructure. It isn't going anywhere. Just because you like to pretend it's dead doesn't make it so, unfortunately. It's one of these only pieces of equipment that we don't really test. I speak to pen testers quite a lot. Surprisingly, being in security, that happens. And what I find out is that most pen testers will get their clients to turn the IPS off. You know, why? Well, financial incentive more than anything else. If you have the IPS on, it's going to take us two days longer. So we go from four days, you know, two days testing, two days reporting to six days. You know, or you could turn the IPS off. What a pointless test, really. You know, we know that we could have popped this web application as long as the file, as long as the IPS is turned off. You know what my high score on that, see, you know, the the high score in the report is I can talk to the, the system admin and get him to turn the IPS off. Yeah, we're doing a test, you need to turn it off. You need to test it. You need to test it like any other piece of infrastructure. I'm going to talk about what makes a good test. But more importantly, I'm going to talk about what makes a really bad test. And we're really good at doing that. Really good at doing that. I'm going to talk about testing limitations. What's easy to test for and what isn't easy to test for. How many of you have got a load balancer in your back pocket? You know, testing the load of an IPS is not as simple as testing an IPS for evasion techniques. You know, some things is relatively easy to test, some things are not. I'm going to talk about a testing methodology, or more to the point that there isn't. Because if I wanted to build a web application, I would literally have to choose a methodology to help me. For testing, I would literally have to choose something. You know, in IPS, this old industry that's been around for God knows how long now, there isn't one testing methodology available. Okay? Not freely. It's kind of worrying, really. I wonder why that is, eh? I wonder why there's no testing methodology. I want to talk about a way forward, or what the OSNIF project is and what we're trying to do, and where we're at. You already know who I am. I'm part troll, part speaker, part, part hacker. Well, I used to be. And I'm an IPS researcher. This is what I do. We do do other bits of business, but I spend my time focusing on detection. Kind of gives you an interesting viewpoint. But really, when we do tests for IPS, what we really need to do is we really need to understand what detection means to an organization. Detection means different things to different people. OK? There is nothing wrong with fulfilling compliancy. That's OK. Right? I'm not going to shoot anyone at dawn because they were like, conforming to a standard or a request of, a, uh, of an auditor. But before we do a test, it's really handy to know that because we can test to make sure the device is compliant with regulation. We can save the money by testing that it's only compliant to regulation. If it is important about detecting, you know, some clients actually want to detect shit. Wow, who would have seen that coming? But knowing that means that we can scale our tests. Personally, I think there's a great benefit in, in testing IPSs. It, it matches expectations against realities. You know, what is... Recently, but two years ago, um, maybe three, I'm getting old, so I have a hazy memory. The, uh, when I was working for, for a, a testing company, I had a phone call from the, the testing software company, I had a phone call from a big financial client. And they said, we don't think your testing software is working. Really? Yeah. Why? Well, we get a 100% success rate with, with your software against our IPS product. Excuse me? Well, whenever we run your testing software against our IPS product, we get told that it's 100% success, that every nasty packet that we've sent we haven't detected. 
Well, how the software works, we play what the Americans would call, uh, call picture capture. You know, if we throw a packet, we receive the packet, we generate the report. So if it's saying 100%, my money is on 100%. But big client, you don't really want to piss them off. Say, OK, we'll come and see you. Right enough, we had a 100% success rate against this IPS device. Needless to say, the client was a little bit pissed off. Just a little. And asked us if we could contact the CTO of the vendor. Now, my old boss, Tony, I am just a padawan to his cynicism. Okay? And I'm a cynical guy, but this guy taught me cynicism to a new level. It was amazing. So he relished the opportunity to speak to the CTO at the, at the vendor. And of course, the vendor didn't really have much choice but to speak to us because their big client, our big client, said they needed to. So, OK. And we say, yay, right. We've, got an IPS. we've done a test on your IPS. And what we've discovered is that it doesn't detect anything. And they said to us, have you initiated a scan from the IPS to let the IPS know that there's a new box on the network? Excuse me? Uh, have you logged into the IPS and scanned the new box on the network? No, we haven't. Ah, well, that's your problem. Well, no, that's kind of a real bad problem because you're a detection system. You should be able to detect that someone is on your network. That's the bare minimum. <laughs> the invasion technique for this organization is just not to tell, him, tell it you're there. Really? So we say to them, right, OK, how do you go about the business of detection? How do you see what packets? How do you, how do you analyze what's going on? Well, we've got great throughput. And the reason we've got great throughput, and we're like buzzword bingo, ding, ding, ding. The reason we've got great throughput is, is we don't scan every packet for every threat. What we do is we do header matching. Right, OK. You do understand, by doing header matching, that if I spoof my header, you can no longer detect me. Well, because what happens is you scan my headers for Apache threats when it's really an IIS threat. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's possible. OK, so let's put this into context. Not only do I have to tell you that I'm breaking in, but I'm going to have to tell you which window I'm breaking in from, and you're actually going to believe me. Yes. OK. Where's the debug panel so that we can tune the rules and, and get this into place? It doesn't have one. So I can't log into the IPS and actually reconfigure it. No. You do know that we understand that basically what you're doing is loading Nessus, white-labeled Nessus, in the background and looking for vulnerabilities that way. You do get that we understand that, don't you? We are starting to get the feeling, yes. OK. This is a piece of shit, and it won't detect anything. You know this, right? Yeah, we know there's some issue. We're going to go back to the drawing board. The statement, I, will, I pissed myself with laughter when I heard that statement. He turned around to him and said, well, that would imply that you used a fucking drawing board in the first case, Doo, and hung up on them. Next day, IPS was back with vendor. Okay? Because, as I say, the evasion technique, I don't tell you you're on the network. Wow, it's a pretty easy one. The problem is, is in the case of testing IDSs, is it, it's a real case of like understanding what detection means to the organization. To this organization, detection meant actually knowing someone was on their network doing bad. Who would have seen that coming? No. It's a case of expectations against realities. In this case, in a lot of cases, IPS is this. Fluffy cat when you expected guard dog. You know, this is what financial organization wanted. This is what they got. <laughs> but in this case, just running one piece of software specifically for testing the IPS shows, did I mention big financial organization? You know, people that look after your money. <laughs> one piece of software, one test. 
finally gets them to know that there is nothing they can do with this IPO. It is also, um, you know, ticked for PCI and it's compliant, blah, 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 because um, that's important. And really, an, an intrusion detection system is really just a system that monitors for malicious behavior, okay? It's always worth remembering that an NIDS is uh, an active, uh, uh, an NIPS is an active member of the network, and an NIDS is a, is a passive member of the network. And there's situations where that's good and there's situations where that's bad. Um, I'll talk about that in a little while. But really, another definition for IPS is cash cow, right? How do you say that, Phoenix? Well, in 2010, Gartner believes that $989 million was spent on standalone IPS products. Okay? Not everything else, just IPS. 989 million. Let's, uh, let's just call that a billion between friends. I'm sure you can let me off. Okay? 2010 is an interesting year. That is the beginning of the European recession. Okay, we bailed out two European countries during that time. AC Milan was uh, valued at 989 million that year. And in 2010, the New York Fed purchased 989 million of agency debt, proving one thing. Fools and their money can soon be separated. Okay. I used to think that the billion was a big number. I was like, wow, that's a lot of, ch just for IPS, that's a lot. I recently discovered that's on average the same amount as the Americans spend on chewing gum per year. So maybe it's not as big as we all think, but it's still a big industry. And what do we know about NIDS IPS? Well, you know, it's that box with the blinky flashy light. You know, the one that nine out of ten times the auditor told you to get. I hear some great auditor horror stories. Oh my God. The one that that vendor says will protect you against all the known bad things. Zero days and apps and all of this stuff. The insider threat. That's the new buzzword, by the way. The, the anti-Snowden box. I have seen vendors talk this way. <laughs> like, I don't know what detection capabilities that you have, but I'm pretty sure a piece of metal is not the best way of detecting a whistleblower. <laughs> I could be wrong. I could be wrong. But the insider threats. We see this now, it's a buzzword. The, the anti-Manning, the anti-Snowden, so on and so forth. Because like an IPS can totally do that. But the one that you can never tell me the detection rate for. The one that if I speak to clients and say, out of 100 threats, how many do you think you'll detect? I don't know. Ooh. Do you not think you might want to know that? Yeah, that's what we're speaking to you. Good, let's get this done. And really, IDS vendors like to kind of make our business as complex as they possibly can. Now, it's not a conference if we don't have MSO867 out to play. When I, when I die, I'm pretty sure they'll retire MSO867 there. Uh, but they like to make out that detection's complex. Well, it's not. Detection business is about events and reactions. That's what it's about. You know, a, a worm exploits a vulnerability in a certain the SMB server, a connection happens, this generates an event. This event is analyzed for a threat. MSO867 is detected, an alert is sent, we save the cyber kingdom, the world is safe once again, we get the girl, we're millionaires. Brilliant. Just it doesn't work that way, does it? Because the real issue here is they need to analyze events and respond to them. This is a key part about IDSs. This is what we need to test. How you manage the events and how you analyze them is how you win or lose. And in some cases, losing is being Sony. You know? We don't hear about the success stories, right? We don't hear about when we get it right. We hear about when we get it wrong, surprisingly. No one talks about because if it's effective and it works, we don't realize that we stopped a really dangerous attack. Vendors like to make out that there's some proprietary secret source, some voodoo magic. Our proprietary cyber 2.1 kill chain, blah, 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 unified threat management, next gen system, deploys all of these great user aware, context driven rule sets. Right, I have no fucking idea what you just said to me there, but that's the conversations we're having now.
And the truth of what detection actually is, is event, condition, countermeasure. They don't give a shit about what you call your device. You get an event, you match a condition, you set a countermeasure, okay? You know, <laughs> the bottom line of it is, is we go back, for some of you that maybe weren't at the first talk earlier on, you know, 50, you know, nearly half of the compromises in the Gartner and Verizon reports are a user going, oh, there's something with my computer that doesn't feel right. Well, how do you get a piece of metal to do that in ones and zeros? How does that happen? We can't even do random fucking numbers. Just ask Debian. <laughs> it was a random throw of the dice we got for. You know? But whatever happens, the reality of the systems are event, condition, countermeasure. These are the things that we need to test for. The Common Intrusion Detection Framework is a document that I believe DARPA uh, worked with on to build an IDS system. Uses this as a concept, as a visualization of really how an IDS breaks down its components. This does not mean you've got four boxes in reality. It just means there's four key components of an IDS. That there is an events box that, surprise, surprise, looks for events. There's an analyzation box that analyzes. You pass the events to the analyzers, and they look at it and go, this is good, this is bad. There's a countermeasures box. Even when you're talking about IDS, the passive member of the network, it's still a countermeasure sending an alert to someone. Okay? Or, and they have a data box, the buffer, the store. You can't react to something that you don't have in front of you. Right? In, all, in essence, all IDS systems have these. When we do evasion techniques, we're trying to do two things. We're trying to either stop an event from happening, or if an event happens, that we, we, we break the analyzation process for the threat. Theoretically, the R targeted attacks could use the data store of an IDS. However, that's well within the realm of academia and very unlikely to see in the real world. Not until someone pisses off some really clever people. Then this is going to be interesting. Because, hey, you're going to take strings that we send you, and you're going to store them inside your database. What could possibly go wrong? Um, countermeasure box, we could just harass a, uh, a system administrator. You know, we'll send you a million threats, a million attacks. What are you likely to see in that? You know, if I put one real one in there, and give you a million to look at, by the time you get to like the 20th or 30th false positive, you've given up, right? So there, there is some legitimate attacks against here. But as I said, evading detection is simple about trying to evade the E box or the A box. But here's the first gotcha. Threats really need to be understood. Who would have thought that was coming? That you actually need to understand how an exploit exploits a vulnerability to be able to effectively write a detection signature for it. Without context, get ready for this word, because you're going to hear this a lot, context, context, context. You know? Without context, it's just log management. That's all you're doing when you get alerts. That's all that's happening. It's you that put the context on it. It's the human eyeball that goes, nah, that's good. As many within the, the, the IDS detection business, we all go through a similar process of thinking, one day we'll be able to make systems that don't need human interaction that will detect things. You know, we need to cut the space, the time that humans are involved in the detection process. And the reality of it is, is the best detection system that we have is us. You know, you want human interaction. You just don't want to overwhelm the human interaction because we're really good at applying context to things. The problem is, in IDS, the simple rules have simple conditions. You know? And this leads to two situations, false positive abuse or something that's really fucking easy to evade detection with. I'm going to pick on SID 1329, or 1239, sorry. Now I'm picking on an old evasion, I'm picking on an old exploit, and I'm picking on an old exploit for a reason, because it's been in the rule database for Snort for over 12 years. So I think I'm right now to be able to point at them and say that this is fucking stupid. And this is all based on 
You know the great thing about being an IDS researcher, when you kind of develop like an IDS research, like you find like an evasion technique or something, you get to troll the shit out of people. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the bot head evasion technique, okay? And what happens here is rainforest poppy finds a threat out in the wild, okay? Out in the wild finds a threat. The wild is the, the key bit to remember here. He then reverse engineers it and discovers that there is a vulnerability in the net BIOS of uh, 98, 95 boxes. I, I know it's an old one, but bear with me. And what he discovered was an old fragment in the server host field of a net BIOS session would re nine out of 10 times make the box reboot or start hanging. A remote DOS tool out in the wild. Rainforest Poppy reverse engineers it. He releases a proof of concept code. He discloses it so that we can start making defenses against it. The detection business starts making detection rules for it. And now all of a sudden, we're defended against CVE 2003-47. Woo, we've got coverage. Then you look at how the rule was authored. Rainforest Poppy is a little bit of a troll too, it turns out. And what he did is he hard-coded a NetBIOS message. You know, if you weren't vulnerable, a NetBIOS message would pop up from Beavis that said, yep, yep. Okay? Surprisingly, they did not look for a null fragment in the server host field of a NetBIOS session. They looked for a static string that said, Beavis, yep, yep. And that's your signature coverage right there. Now, Rainforest Poppy, for shits and giggles, hard-coded it in from Beavers, and that's why they thought their ass was safe, right? Not that it would take someone like myself 30 seconds to change it from Beavers to Bothead, and all of a sudden, the 12-year mature rule that's sitting in those, those signatures is evaded by character matching, by changing Beavers to Bothead. That is the butthead evasion technique. But don't worry, you have coverage for CVE 200347, right? You're defended against that vulnerability. And this is the problem with simple rules, that they give you a false sense of security. You know, but you, we're doing stupid things like this and leaving it there. The problem is complex is complex, right? There's no shortcut. You know, if it's a complex issue, then it'll be a complex solution. That's the long story short of it. But that's the second process. That's the second problem here. Complex also means more processing. What do we think the direct result of that's going to be? Less of a throughput. We talk about an industry that doesn't talk about detection rates, only talks about throughput. And now all of a sudden, to actually detect complex threats, we have to admit that we have to think about it a little bit longer, which will slow the network traffic down. Right? This is why it's important at the beginning to understand what is important for the client. If detection is important for the client, then prep them for there might be some throughput issues. Because we need to buffer things a little bit longer. It takes time, but as I say, you know, if your organization is completely about throughput, then you know, stick an IDS in and tell them that their risk appetite is slightly bigger. And I educate a guess about most IDS owners. They can't tell me what their system's detection rate is, but they will be able to tell me what the throughput is. You know, they can't tell me, they can tell me what threats their latest update defended them against, but can't actually prove it. But they can always tell me how, how many false positives they stuff. Oh, we deal with this many, blah, 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 blah. And how do we know? Because vendors talk about throughput, not detection. So here's some food for thought for any of you that manage an IDS, look after an IDS, right? Out of 100 threats, right? This will be the indicator for you now. Out of 100 threats, how many will your box defend? This is your burglar alarm, and you don't even know if it works because you're probably going, I don't know. Throughput is important, but if you could only choose one thing, detection or prevention, right? I'm not saying you can't have it all, but I'm saying, at the beginning of your testing of an IPS device, ask yourself, if I can have one or the other, which would it be? These are important questions to ask. I'm sorry that I have broken protocol. I haven't put a Sanzu quote up there or a Tiger Woods quote or the art of war or anything like that. I went for Lewis Carroll this time. Um, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. 
This is testing of IPS devices in a nutshell. And more to the point, what have we been doing so far? And I'm going to pick on the testers here. And I'm, I'm going to say stuff to you that you're all going to go, hey, that sounds really familiar. So we do an IPS test. I've spoken to a lot of pen testers about what makes an IPS test. And what generally happens is we do some packet manipulation, then we put a sacrificial host up in a VM and we hack it with Metasploit. And then we write a report back. And that is how we do IPS testing. Well, no, that's not how we do IPS testing. What we're doing there is actually testing the tester to see how good he is against the detection system. That's all we're doing there, man versus IPS. Great. There is no return investment because, A, it's not recreatable science. You know, dude gets another job. You get poor tester in, and now, all of a sudden, you're even more secure because the poor tester wasn't as knowledgeable. That's the direct result of poor testing. Yay, our IPS is even better. No, that guy's only got 18 months experience compared to the guy that had 20 months experience, compared to the guy that had three years experience, compared to the guy that had been doing this for a decade. You know, you can make your security metrics go through the roof with this by just using unseasoned people. But this is testing. This is what's happening. How many of you have had a penetration test? More importantly, how many of you even tested your IPS? But it always goes, oh, it will be two days testing and three days reporting. Really? Right? We don't even know what you're testing. You're just making some packets do some freaky stuff. You know, what have you learned? That an IPS potentially can be bypassed. Great. Thanks for that. In other news, water is wet. You know? And no, it can be bypassed. I was worried about it. That's why I asked you to test it. Thanks. Where is it, where is it going wrong? The issue is here is that all we've done is prove that it's broken. We've not proved what was broken. It, doesn't, it means, makes it even harder for us to go back and fix it. Okay? We're not, and here comes the, the, here comes the rant. If you, if you feel like you've been going through a rant, I am sorry. We're just going to turn it up by 11. Okay? But what will happen here is that with this man versus IPS, right? And what, as I say, all we're doing in the end is testing the man against the IPS. We're not actually testing the IPS. We're testing his skill against the skill of a machine. Thanks. Why don't we just write a league table? And then these are the pen testers that we're going to employ. You know? Produce sample traffic. Something that's recreatable. You know, not just turning up, not taking a run at it as a methodology just sucks. Right? I'm just gonna have a, I'm just gonna see if I can break it. Great. But that doesn't really help us defend the kingdom anymore. Is it recreatable? The definition of science is something to be that, that is recreatable by different people. We're supposed to be a science-related discipline. Really? We just take a run at it. That's not much of a methodology, and it sure as sure as shit isn't recreatable. Guy goes, bring in new guy. The same science is not recreatable. The same test is not recreatable. We do this in IPS every day, and then we wonder why it doesn't detect shit. Because we use a skill, because we've, we've been prepping ourselves for pen tester. This does not mean using sample traffic means that you lack interaction. What it means is I'm going to, ah, now I get to conform to security standards. I'm going to get to use an Abraham Lincoln quote. You know, I think offensive security uses it, but you know, if I had six hours to cut or seven hours to cut a tree down, I would spend six hours sharpening the axe. You know, it's the same in IPS tests. Just because you're using sample traffic doesn't mean that you don't prep. You sit in the lab, you make your test cases, you make your test conditions, and then you go and test the IPS with recreatable traffic. Replaying attack has some serious advantages. For starters, it's recreatable. Hey, it's science again. Also, man versus IPS, right? Dude, packet manipulation, metasploit, sacrificial host. How many exploits can he do in any one day? Right? It's limited. How many exploits can I send in a second? At least 4,000. So let's see how good he is now that I can get decent coverage of a lot of attacks really quickly. Plus, benefit number two, 
once you have a sample of the threat that you want to detect, you can contact the vendor. Because the vendor gets to get away with, we can't, make, we can't recreate your issue, right? We can't make that happen because we don't have the pen tester there. What are you going to do? Send the pen tester off to the vendor. We can send them maybe a PCAP file and have them replay it and say, hey, look, maybe we've misconfigured this wrong. Maybe we've understood this wrong. Is it a mistake that we've made or is it a mistake that you've made? Here is our test case. We expected it to detect it. You said that we've detected CVE 2000-0347. And when we tested it, it didn't happen. There's recreatable science. You get some return on investment there because you get to actually understand why stuff isn't working anymore. Taking a run at it sucks as a methodology, right? Being blind and running at an IPS, really, it's not the best way of doing it. And it's really, really important to remember that once something is detected, it should always be detected. The problem is, is that you can't verify that without when there's too many variables involved that you need to make recreatable science. Sometimes, a snort, if you fire a thousand threats at it and then fire a thousand threats at it again and fire a thousand threats at it again and fire the same thousand threats at it again and keep on doing that for a little while, what you'll notice is there is a slight discrepancy in its detection rates. That's interesting, I would have thought. You know, that, that there is some form of timing issue there and you need to be prepared for that. One day you'll get good results and one day you won't. Maybe it's worth doing it. And as an industry, this is what we do. This is the issue that we do. We have no standard approach. Oh my God, long hair hacker is sitting here talking about standards. I know the world is, is about to you know, implode, but we have no standard in the way that we do this, uh, pr this testing, which means that everyone tests differently. And what happens is we get one company that comes in and says, one year, yay, we did a test and we tested a few things and what we've discovered is you've got three highs, two mediums and a few, in, and a few issues. And then the next guy that comes in a year later, they're going to get a report back that says, you've scored 4.3. Of what? You know, there's no standard. There's no, you have to keep on going to the same tester to get the same testing back. Well, this is a problem. We are a multi-billion dollar industry. They believe the IPS, the standalone IPS industry, bearing in mind 2.7 billion isn't chump change for Cisco, but it's still, they reckon there's going to be around $2.4 billion worth of money spent on standalone IPS products this year. You know, <laughs> for sucking that badly, it's a little bit worrying. But we all, have standard, we all have different approaches. And the real issue is we reinvent the wheel in each organization that we're in. We, we, we keep on like, going out and doing the same things independently of each other. And we never really share, and we never make the world better, and we never teach all the children to sing in perfect harmony. You know, I'm not talking about like, the ideal world, but bearing in mind, no methodology for testing IPS. So here's the idea. The open source network intrusion framework. Okay, I'm going to admit to a little bit of plagiarism here. I looked to OWASP and thought, it'd be fucking good if we had one of those for for uh, detection systems, wouldn't it? Be good. They've done okay for web application security. Shame we don't have that. The problem is when you have an idea, in the end, you have to implement it. So, it was my first day at my last job, my first day on, on a job recently, and they said to me, what research do you think we can do? And I floated the idea of the open source network intrusion framework. And the worrying thing happened there is they agreed with me and I ended up having a large section of my time talking about this stuff. So, what is OSNF? Well, potentially it's an organization a lot like OWASP. At the moment we have about 30 members. With a long-term goal of producing and supporting a freely available testing methodology for IDS and IPSs, okay? To try and actually make the situation a little bit better, you know, to actually bring a standard. The idea is it for to, to be a documentation project, you know? We all hate this open source mentality that because we use open source, you must always use open source, you know? But it's an like for organizations, it's important for them to be free to do what they need. A methodology should tell you what to test, not how to test. How, you know, an organization knows if it can afford X amount of man hours for a person to get this open source tool and make it work versus paying a company X amount of dollars to test the same thing. 
Organization is a better place to make those decisions. Certainly not a methodology. Not, well, I don't know how even how you would go about writing a methodology that could cover that. My friend said to me when we were talking about this, yeah, you know, it's a good model, OWASP. You know what would be really good? As if, like, you know, like the OWASP top 10? We should totally have one of those for IDS. That'd be really good. And I thought, you know what, that's actually a good idea. I'll speak to a few people, see what they think. I'm like, yeah. Actually, it would be a good idea to have like 10 things that you should look at. And then someone who's a lot more cleverer than I said, you know what would be really good? I said, what? You should look for five. It'll take you half the time. <laughs> but a lot of the criticism of OWASP top 10 is that it's not you know, democratic, it's chosen by one person, blah, 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 blah. And the truth of the situation is that we're at the start of, of, of an organization's birth. You know, and there's only certain things that I can, I can fix. And the long story short is that we can't really get a massive democratic process to pull in 10. The flip side of this is as well, by forcing 10 in, we'll probably put stuff in there that shouldn't be there. So the idea is we start off, off with five, where I've spoke to all the OWASP members and talked to people about it. And if it grows, it grows. If it doesn't, it doesn't. It isn't a full testing methodology, but I tell you what, it's a good start of things that you should look at. When speaking to people, what we discovered really quickly was people wanted deployment guidelines. You know, surprise, surprise, people want to deploy things correctly. Who would have thought that? People don't want to misconfigure or put in the wrong piece of equipment. And yet there is no, lack of a better term, best practice for, for deploying and purchasing IPS. So, this is the initial draft of the OSNIF top five. This has been brought together by people from the industry. We don't have any vendors as members. That's not because they're excluded. That's just because they don't want to play with us, okay? When I speak to vendors and they're in the room and they talk about this stuff, they're totally up for supporting us and we will swap emails. And yeah, this is exactly what we need. We need, we need, to, we need to level the marketplace out for us all. This would be great and then I never hear from them again. So I kind of feel like I'm doing things right. So the first thing that, pe the, first thing that the, the OceanX group discovered, and it's basically speaking to everyone within the group, is these are not ranked in order of importance, they're just there, that's all, okay? Configuration issues should be something that you should consider when you're doing an IPS IDS effective test, okay? Looking for poorly tuned systems. We have never had a false positive on our IPS. Never had a true positive either, you know? This happens more than you would think. It really does happen more than you think. It's probably an indicator. But it's really, really easy to test for. Take a threat, run it, and if you don't see detection, when you know it should be detecting it, guess what? There's probably a configuration issue there. There's a huge benefit in you discovering a configuration issue rather than someone who's visiting your network. It also helps you pick up this stupid IPS configured between two encrypted endpoints. You know, this is the most stupidest thing I ever see, and I see it all the time. I hate it. You're probably all going to have to, like, you know, have to send me to counseling or something. False positives. Yay, the Achilles heel of IDS. Okay? False positive abuse is right up there on issues. Okay? We deal with 50,000 false positives a day. Shit, how do you handle that? We don't. You know, I was at a talk, 44Con, doing my false positive, using false positives as a tool to enumerate IPS devices. So sending out stuff that I know would trigger off alerts and seeing how the IPS responded to it, and then enumerating the security posture that way. And I said, you know, are you really going to pick up 30 or 40? packets being thrown into your network. The guy basically stands up and says, I think you're wrong, in the middle of my talk. I thought, huh, he's either had something to drink or he knows something that I don't. You've greatly underestimated the problem. Have I? I'm the only one talking about enumerating IPSs this way. H how? We deal with 25 to 50,000 false positives, and they literally don't deal with it. They just log management. The problem is, is the validity of the machine gets put into question. You can enumerate attacks and, and defenses. 
um, can be used as an invasion technique, but more importantly, can cost your organization money. The gentleman on the front row will be talking about economy, uh, the economics of false positives, but the reality is, is let's just do some barroom math between ourselves now. They deal with 50,000 false positives a day. How do they manage it? They don't. They just tick boxes. Even having a guy tick a box for an hour a day, times that by seven, times that by four, times that by 52, then times that by the global locations that that happens in, and then all of a sudden, you have a rough estimate of a bare minimum what false positives are costing you. Okay? You can see how that can escalate pretty quickly. You know, okay, it's, it's just rough science. It's not the best science in the world, but I tell you what, it might just actually help you to go back to management and say, you know, rather than giving us 120,000 euros to invest in metal, why don't you give me 60,000 euros to invest in skin and we can really start to, to save some money here. And this is, this is what we, at bare minimum, are losing. But also, if you're hiding false positive, if you're hiding true positives, how organizations respond to IDSs is, is important, uh, to false positives is important. You know, there is a cost to managing this. You need to accept this and look at it, but you also need to look. False positives ultimately are a result of incident response because it's a true positive until you know it's a false positive. So you need to find the process, you need to test the process within an organization of how they handle those issues. What's the matter with them? You know, do they just ignore them? If they do, how do we, how do we fix that problem? Protocol ambiguities, you need to test for this. This needs to be looked at, you know. Just taking, the, remember this saying that we say all the time, trust but verify. Apparently in security, we're really bad at that because we just take people's word that it does protocol normalization. We don't test it properly. Oops. How do we look for protocol normalization issues as I discussed earlier on? You find an RFC, you look for the gray area, find an evasion technique, you know, Evasion techniques. Seriously, test your IDS for evasion techniques. Asian, evasion techniques are really simple to detect. We did evasion technique training yesterday, and the guys learned really, really quickly that, you know what, it's dead easy to spot this stuff. Testing that your IDS is capable of handling known evasion techniques, is, is, there's some benefit in this. I've already talked about advanced evasion techniques but, you know, you put two old evasion techniques together, call it new, and engage a marketing machine. Um, we'll leave them alone. But they did, re they did release a book last year called Advanced Evasion Techniques for Dummies. I thought that was interesting. Detection rates. I used to, this is probably the last rant, I think, the reality of detection rates are that I used to think that you could get a global detection rate for a vendor, okay? It's maybe a little bit naive. Didn't take me long to realize that that's actually the most pointless thing in the world, right? I don't care if a vendor, the only detection rate that you should care about is your own detection rate. It doesn't matter what your neighbor does. You're the one looking after the network. It's your detection rate. So you need to work out what your internal detection rate is so that you can go back and say, hey, look, we only on average detect 22% of the attacks that we put over that network. I think we might need to do some security in depth and put some, you know, put something behind this IPS. I want you promised me security in depth. Well, you need to make sure that we can actually deliver that. It is a legitimate question to ask. You know, don't feel guilty for asking what the detection rate of your system is. Okay, it's completely fine. It's okay. It's your system. Now, why should you be interested in testing IDSs? Well, you know, compliance is a legitimate argument for having a detection system, granted. But just ask Sony how, com how, uh, how just being compliant helped their business. You know, they lost a PSN. They lost reputation. They got fined by regulators, you know. But they were compliant. Now, I'm not saying that you should get involved in RSNF. All I'm saying is, is that you should think about how you do testing. 
we've got some stuff on the ground and we're working very hard to produce an open source testing methodology that's not as simple as it sounds, but we thought it was important to get something out there to help people work with stuff right now. You know, if you don't look after IDF, speak to someone that does and ask them if they need an independent open source organization to actually has an agenda about effective testing of IDS. Surprise, surprise, if you want to get a hold of us, we have a very skinny wiki that isn't massively user friendly, but we're trying. We're just geeks, we're sorry, but there you go. We have a mailing list that anyone can join up to. And surprise, surprise, you can find us at osniff.org. If you are someone that manages someone that looks after IPS, give them some time off to actually learn how to do the job, okay? If you're someone that looks after it, argue your boss to give you some time off so that you can go and learn how to do it, okay? It's an asset, and without it being looked after, you know, it's just the problems will come. You know, you don't want to leave it to a bad guy to test your IPS effectiveness, but that's what happens all the time. So, do you guys have any questions for me? So, any questions? Right at the back. Yeah. Um, so, let's say we get a magic tool that tests all that. Uh, wouldn't the vendors simply configure the software so that, ta-da, 100% detection rate, the tool is useless again? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. That's exactly what's going to happen. But look at the side effect of doing that. We've lost those problems as a result of that. We'll have new problems to occur. Detection is not a one machine, uh, one machine solution. Detection is a complex thing that requires constant attention. I mean, it requires like massaging and management. You know, you don't just buy a detection system and suddenly detect all the things. You know, you have to work with it, and you have to work with it continually. It's an asset like anything else. So yeah, you know, will the will the IPS industry become like the AV industry, or will the AV industry become like the IPS industry? So I mean, yeah, probably. Any more for any more? Some more questions? Well, guys, I would like to thank you very much for coming and joining us today. I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. Um, you've been awesome, guys. Okay, thank you. Um, the registration desk asked me for Mr. Katalov and Utin uh, to come to the registration.